Questions without notice. Senator Alston. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government. Order. Are you with us? Order. Order. Order, Senator, Senator Faulkner. Senator Alston. Well, no, nonetheless, we're grateful that Senator Evans has called in today. So, could I ask him a question? According to the World Bank, Australia fell from 19th in the world in 1992 to 22nd in 1993 in terms of international per capita income. Now, the Business Council expects we will slide even further. Why is Australia, one of the, the world's most resource-rich countries, continuing to slide down the international league table? Is it because, as the McKinsey study shows, Australia's relatively low productivity is costing the country around $30 billion a year in lost opportunities, cut prices and increased wages, or is it simply that after 13 years of labour, this is as good as it gets? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, that's a pretty extraordinary question to ask, Mr President, in a week in which we've just had an announcement of 1.6 per cent growth uh, for this quarter, which indicates that we are absolutely on track to sustain a very substantial and importantly positive rate of growth uh, for the period ahead, just as we have for the last 17 quarters, which is, of course, uh, an Australian record since these uh, statistics uh, were kept. The Australian economy is in remarkably good shape in terms of all the basic fundamentals, and you know what those fundamentals are. The, uh, and I'll be happy to repeat them. The, uh, the crucial uh, further statistic that's emerged uh, this week is, of course, the um, balance of payments figures, external debt. Uh, the external payments uh, account, the October figures this morning, demonstrating uh, absolutely again on track in terms of the, uh, the current account deficit, uh, recording its sixth consecutive monthly decrease in trend terms and reaching its lowest level since uh, February 1994 in such uh, trend terms absolutely in line with the government's uh, budget forecast, despite all the scepticism and neurosis and angst that you were hurling at us for months on end. Uh, the parrots are not talking about current account deficit, it seems, anymore. The caravan has moved on because we, because we basically, of course, uh, have a structural environment in terms of our capacity to go on generating uh, exports that will keep that uh, merchandise account uh, positive to uh, make this not a problem of any significant magnitude at all. If you look at all the other elements of our economic environment in terms of the productivity performance, in terms of the investment growth, in terms of the export growth, in terms of the capacity at the same time as we're growing in all these respects to sustain a wage uh, environment, including the social wage, which makes us the envy of the other developed economies where there are fundamental disparities uh, which exist uh, between economies like North America, where you've got uh, a low uh, high wage environment but uh, high levels of efficiency in many ways in the economy, but a very poor uh, social justice set of indicators running alongside that compared with the dilemma faced, on the other hand, by developed countries in Europe, where everything is doing fine in social justice terms and social equity terms, but you've got fundamental inefficiencies evident in that side of the economy. Australia has got it right. We've got the balance right in all those respects. I haven't seen the particular figures to which uh, Senator Alston uh, is referring. It's inevitable, given the explosive growth of so many uh, economies in the East Asian uh, region, that uh, there would be some change in relativities in terms of income per head figures. That's been a fact of life uh, throughout the course of this century. None of these things are ever static. But Australia, in terms of the fundamental strength of the economy, the sustainability of the growth that we have in the economy, the way in which uh, interest rates and inflation and all those other key indicators of a capacity to sustain growth on an ongoing basis in an employment reducing way, the way all those figures are coming together, gives us absolutely nothing whatsoever to be ashamed about in terms of international comparisons and in fact a very great, in fact, a very great deal to be proud of. Supplementary, Senator Olsen. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, I note your shamelessness. You're uh, quite keen on reading editorials, so I ask you why is the Financial Review not correct when it says today 
The harsh reality is that once the one-off bounce back in rural output and the unsustainable lift in stock levels are removed, the result is a domestic economy as flat as the proverbial pancake. And why isn't Max Walsh correct when he simply analyses quite factually that domestic demand growth in the economy fell away during the September quarter, personal consumption expenditure grew at less than half the rate in September than in June, private business expenditure on equipment actually fell in September compared with an increase in the June quarter? Why won't you come clean and face the facts that this country is going backwards, our standard of living is declining, our productivity Order. levels are at record lows? And the place has run out of steam. Now, why won't Order. you face up to those facts rather than simply resorting to silly and irrelevant rhetoric? The Minister, Senator Evans. There's nothing silly and irrelevant about the basic strengths of the Australian economy as I've described them. There's nothing silly or irrelevant about the fact that we just have achieved a 1.6 per cent quarter of growth following a 1 per cent growth in the June quarter before that. A growth largely due to net exports as well as an increase in stocks. A growth uh, that's obviously significantly attributable to the bounce back of the farm factor, of the farm sector, but which has a lot of inherent strength about it. The fundamentals of the Australian economy are as rock solid and sound as they have ever been. If someone in the editorial department of the Fin Review wants to uh, be a churl about uh, finding something to complain about, in order to uh, accommodate the neuroses of its basic domestic constituency, not to mention the one opposite, well, so be it. But we, uh, we are confident about the strength of the economy. We are confident, as we have to be, as any Australian would be, about an economy that has been growing for 17 consecutive quarters and Australian expired. record. Senator Cooney. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my uh, question is to the Minister for Trade. Indeed, it might be the last question to the uh, present Minister of Trade that's asked from this side of the Chamber in any event. And, uh, in doing this, I'd like to, uh, like to pay tribute to the way he's answered the questions over his uh, time here. It's been, there have been eloquent answers. They have been uh, put with well-turned phrases. They have been responsive, Order. succinct, clear of any remarks that may uh, upset honourable senators. Indeed, typical of the uh, quick, smart, responsive answers that are given by our ministers on this side. Uh, I, I hope the question is a short one. Senator. It's a very short question. In fact, it's one that's elegant. That it's very well put by uh, the minister himself. What do uh, recent data, such as today's balance of payments figures, indicate about the direction of Australia's trade performance? The, the, the minister, order. The minister for trade, Senator McMullen. I thank Senator. Order. I thank Senator Kearney for his characteristically eloquent question, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President, and uh, I hope nobody is under the misleading Order. impression that I am heartbroken about the fact that this might be my last, that this will be my last Senate question time. So, the. Uh, hmm? Yeah, you want to bet? Uh, uh, to uh, to put the current Order. situation in context. Uh, uh, it's interesting to uh, note by uh, order, order, Senator McMullen. Would you take a seat and we'll just wait for a bit of silence? It just is hopeless trying to talk against that. Order, Senator McMullen. Order, Senator McMullen, giving notice to this chamber that even if the parliament sits next year, he'll prefer to stay overseas, like Senator Evans. <laughs> There's no point of order, Senator McMullen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, a good point, is, but no point of order. It is very. Uh, it's actually interesting to put in uh, the current uh, export situation in a bit of a, a historic context, because uh, by some accounts, uh, last Tuesday, Tuesday of this week, saw an important anniversary in Australia's economic history. The uh, historians suggest that on the 28th of November, 1795, was the, the first day of any commercial export from Australia. Uh, from the Hawkesbury region of New South Wales to India, and there's the first recorded export in our post-European settlement. So we're talking about 200 years of Australia as an exporting nation, uh, and we spent a lot of that 200 years missing a lot of good opportunities and surviving on the basis, uh, surviving on the basis of extraordinary, extraordinary resource potential, not and uh, failure to develop all the other opportunities particularly over the period from the 50s to the 80s, when our sloth allowed a lot of good opportunities to go unremarked. 
but in the past decade we have seen a fundamental and qualitative change in our trade performance. And let's have a look at some of the key figures in this last week which indicate the direction and the strength of the changes taking place. And this supports entirely the point that Senator Evans has just made. For the first time in our history, last Tuesday's figures suggest, show we have achieved a quarterly surplus in our trade in services. First time in our history, quarterly surplus in the trade in services, which is where the world's economic growth, trade growth, is most concentrated. Yesterday, we saw the release of the national accounts that showed net exports contributed 1.3 per cent to GDP growth. And while people are saying somehow oh, that's a problem, that's exactly the sort of growth Australia needs, growth generated by net exports. And today's balance of payments confirmed the significant improvement in our current account outlook that's causing so much anxiety to our colleagues across the way who wish things would continue to get worse. They continue to pray for disaster and get disappointed when they find any success. These indicators suggest that Australia may well have stepped onto a higher economic growth path based on improved export performance, particularly compared with our record in the two decades up to the 1980s. For example, over the last decade, merchandise exports have recorded average trend growth of 8.7 per cent a year, and manufactured exports have grown even more quickly by 15 per cent a year, elaborately transformed manufacturers by 17 per cent, services by 9. So we are seeing that there is every indication that this higher growth path can be sustained into the next century. We have already broken the Australian record for sustained economic growth. The important thing to note is that our trade strategy and performance suggests we can sustain that economic growth into the next decade, with all the consequential benefits for jobs and living standards which follow from that. <coughs> Sup supplementary, Senator Kearney. Thanks, Scott. Oh, he's coming again. Now, let, we've got, be gracious, be gracious. Uh, what is the government doing in trade policy to lock in these gains and build them? The Minister, Senator McMullen. Mr. Chairman, in a minute, there's not, uh, one can't be very comprehensive about that, but of course there are three tiers of trade strategy to deal with those issues. Firstly, at the uh, global level through the World Trade Organisation, uh, to which Australia will be adding by the conference we're holding in Brisbane in February to uh, build momentum for further reform at the multilateral level. There's regional policy, uh, most noticeably but not only APEC, uh, and on the bilateral uh, front, Early next year, I'll be releasing the annual trade and investment development paper, and at that time, I also propose to outline a strategy to uh, take advantage of the trade opportunities in our most prospective markets, together with an outlook for Australian exports to the year 2000. So, with that integrated uh, multilateral, regional, and trade strategy, I think it builds on what I, the indications I mentioned before to confirm reasonable ground for optimism that exports will continue to pump into growth right through until the end of the century. Senator Knowles. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Evans. According to Professor Bob Gregory of the Australian National University and long-term member of the Reserve Bank Board, the average income in the poorest of Australian households has fallen by almost $8,000 in real terms and increased in real terms by nearly $13,000 in the highest earning households. Why, after 13 years of labour, has income fallen in 70 per cent of the households and only risen in 30 per cent? Why, after 13 years of labour, have over 750,000 households been added to the battler category, Order. and with over one million battler households anticipated Order. by the year 2000? And why, after 13 years of labour, do we have more poor than ever before, Order, with right. over 767,000 unemployed, nearly two million people? Uh, of our people living in poverty, with almost 600,000 of these people in poverty being children. After 13 years of labour, why can't the, the Australian Senators people presume that labour has lost its way? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Mr President, from an opposition whose leader can't quite remember the commitment to maintaining pensions at 25 per cent of average weekly earnings, who has to stumble and fumble his way through any question he's ever asked on something that goes to 
the real capacity to survive effectively of people at the lower end of the income spectrum in this country, for an opposition who is as utterly indifferent as you are to these sort of issues, to make assertions of the kind that you have, and to question the income distribution that's been achieved under us in this country, demonstrates uh, not only extreme ignorance as to what has been uh, achieved over the last decade or more, uh, but also represents extreme dose of cheek uh, from you, given the events, as I say, of the last few days. The whole point about uh, income distribution within Australia is that it can only be understood in the context of the social wage, which is the means by which the government provides health and education and housing and childcare benefits to all Australians. And the increases and the improvements in that social wage, in benefits delivered in other ways than through the wage packet, has had a dramatic impact, a dramatic impact in redistributing income to those most in need. The uh, recent uh, research from NatSem has found that the social wage has increased and listen to this, Senator Knowles, the social wage has increased Order. from $969 in 82-83 to $1,677 in 94-95. And it is the case that low and middle income families benefit very substantially from the non-cash component of the social wage. For example, an average middle income family receives benefits now valued at $225 per week. That's on top of the 146 per cent increase in social security payments that has been achieved between 83 and 95. For example, additional family payments for children from 13 to 15 have increased by 146 per cent. Rent assistance has increased by between 78 and 137 per cent. The age pension, about which you are so ignorant and indifferent on your side, has increased by between 13 and 14 per cent. Real household disposable income has increased by 41.5 per cent during the period between March uh, 83, March quarter 83, and June quarter 95. Again, the um, research by the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling shows that during the 1980s, the richest 10 per cent of the population got poorer, relatively speaking, and those with low and middle incomes, in fact, got richer. It's a matter of understanding the relevant components that go into the equation. Preliminary results uh, from the University of Melbourne study support that. They show that once the impact of governmental intervention in the form of cash income support, taxes, and the way the tax system operates, and non-cash social wage benefits, once all that is taken into account, the small increase in the dispersion of private incomes that has been evidenced since 81-82, and to which you're referring, is in fact reversed. It's reversed in its practical impact. In fact, the distribution of income is more equal in 93-94, the last figures for which the uh, University of Melbourne study is applicable, than it was in 81-82. The facts are these, Mr President, that the government intervention, our government's intervention, through the cash transfer system, through the tax system and through the social wage generally, has increased the living standards of Australians across all incomes and contributed to increased equality in this country. Mr. Supplementary, Senator Knowles. Mr. President, I've never heard a greater clarification of how out of touch this government really is. My supplementary will repeat some of those allegations, uh, some of those facts, not allegations, facts, facts. Order. Why, if, it, if everything is so good as you have just said it is under your government, why has income fallen in 70% of households around Australia? Why are there 750,000 households added to the battler category? Why are there 767,000 people unemployed and living in poverty? And why are there 600,000 children living in poverty if it's all so good that you've just said? Your time's up. You've let people down. Why don't you shift on and have an election? <coughs> the Minister, Senator. Yeah, Senator Niles won't, won't be Order. told, but let me tell her. The Household Expenditure Survey, which she's basing her figures, only provides information based on gross income. It does not pick up the redistributive effect of the tax system or the non-cash benefits of the social wage. It only captures and surveys like it, including the OECD one, which I think you were referring to earlier on before, the Luxembourg income study, the international one. These studies don't show the total picture in terms of the real income distribution, the real, the real total picture Order. as it exists when you take into account the tax system, when you take into account cash transfers, when you take into account all the other benefits of the social wage. 
You scratch anyone out there in the community who is receiving those benefits, and you'll get the answer that Order. you don't want to have. And that answer is that this is a more equal society than it was when we came into office. It's a society and a country with a very proud record of social justice and distributive equality. Our record has been absolutely first class across all the those fronts. You're just expired. a bunch of shonks and will forever remain so. Minister's time has expired. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator Evans, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister, no doubt you will be aware of the keen interest which members of the Australian Parliament and the Senate in particular take in developments in Burma and in the struggle for democracy which is currently going on there. Could the Minister give the Government's view on the latest reports that the political situation in Myanmar is deteriorating and that there is a risk that backward steps may be taken? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Mr President, there is a mounting concern which I share. Order about current political developments in Burma, Myanmar, where the Slork's refusal to enter into any kind of meaningful dialogue with Dora Aung San Suu Kyi since her release is causing increased tension. I am particularly concerned, as senators more sensitive than Senator Alston over there would also be, no doubt, by press reports that uh, special army guards have been placed outside the houses of several National League for Democracy NLD, leaders and that there is widespread speculation that some re-arrests may be imminent. Such a course, if it were to occur, would be a very serious development and a clear demonstration, if we haven't had this already, that the release of Dora Aung San Suu Kyi and the whole national convention process were not motivated by a genuine desire on the part of the SLORC to bring about democratic change in Burma. The most obvious formal vehicle for that process of reconciliation and democratic change would obviously be the national convention. But the lack of confidence in the convention by the NLD is such that following the opening, opening session of the resumed convention a couple of days ago, on the 28th of November, the NLD has decided to withdraw its delegates. As I've said on many occasions, the Australian government has reservations about the composition and process of the convention. We've encouraged the government of Myanmar or Burma to open up membership of the convention to make it more representative both of the will of the people at large and also specifically the ethnic composition of the country, and also to permit within the convention more open discussion and debate of the issues that are vitally important to the country's political future. If this were done, the credibility of the process would manifestly improve and the chances of the convention's conclusions being accepted by the people of Myanmar, as well as better, being better recognised overseas, would be significantly increased. So we urge once again the SLORC and all the political parties to proceed with caution <coughs> excuse me, to address their differences through dialogue in a spirit of na national reconciliation. Both the SLORC and the NLD remain on record as acknowledging the importance of national reconciliation. The important thing is to actually deliver it. <coughs> Can I say finally that the um, Australian government continues to urge all parties to proceed peacefully and to avoid any possibility of a repeat of the mass civil disturbances and violence, extreme and outrageous violence, that marred uh, Burma in 88-89. It's obvious that confrontation and violence are not going to resolve the current political problems in the country. Dialogue undertaken in a spirit of genuine reconciliation should be able to achieve the stated aim of both the government and the NLD, which is to establish a stable and peaceful multi-party democratic system of government. This is manifestly the desire of the people of Burma. It's also the desire of the whole international community. We all want to see that troubled country finally achieve the peace and prosperity that was promised in the years immediately after independence, but which has been so long denied. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, my question is to Senator Evans also, uh, and it concerns a meeting of the ACT branch of the Public Service Union today, where uh, unionists are complaining of the redistribution of income in the public service from the, wealthy, from the, the lower income earners to higher income earners. It points out that since this Labor government assumed office in 83, wages for lower and middle grades in the APS have fallen between 1 and 15 per cent, while real incomes for the highest grades have risen between 11 and 33 per cent. That is, all low and middle income earners in the public service have suffered big declines, whilst the highest earners have enjoyed big successes. Why is this so? Why haven't you protected your own low and middle income employees? And is it this neglect of your own employees, typical of your attitudes and policies, 
which have created such a gap between high and low income earners right across the country. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator well, Evans. Mr President, I don't follow with the attention I obviously should the processes of the ACT branch of the PSU, and I'm not familiar with any current discontents that uh, may have been articulated by them today or at any other time. But I'd be very interested, uh, as others behind me are saying, to hear what your side of politics is saying about uh, that particular process within the public service, which has been one of uh, steady improvement in conditions, as you'd expect over that period. It has been accompanied by certainly some increases in remuneration at the higher levels of the public service, increases in remuneration which we haven't heard you to challenge at any stage of that process because you've argued them to be, as we have acknowledged, necessary to maintain competitiveness at the higher managerial levels within the service with salaries and remuneration that's on offer outside. The important thing is for those who are at the lower ends of the spectrum within the public service, that they not fall behind the rest of the community uh, or not fall behind in real terms, in terms of standard of living uh, slippages. Um, and that's, of course, something we've been able to achieve for the public service in exactly the same way that we've been able to achieve it for the community as a whole, through cash transfer payments, through the operation of the tax system and through all those other elements of the social wage that you simply refuse to acknowledge are currently very much part of the real equality uh, distribution of income and distribution of access to resources uh, that exists in this uh, country at the moment. The public service employees are in that sense no different from the community as a whole and their remuneration would need necessarily to be looked at uh, against exactly the background of those additional considerations that's the case for lower income earners absolutely everywhere else. And if Senator Hill has any different view as to how this particular remuneration system ought to work for the public service, now is the time for him to be telling us about it, along with telling us every other aspect of your policy approach, uh, which at the moment you remain silent about. If you're not prepared to do so, you shouldn't be challenging what is a manifestly equitable and just uh, system of income delivery that we've been able to achieve. Supplementary, what Senator I'm asking, uh, Hill. Supplementary, what I'm asking the minister is after 13 years of labour how he justifies his administration leading to lower real wages for average earners and lower in the public service. If I read from this, uh, the background material of the union, I quote, the government's accords with the union have only served to redistribute income from the workers to management. Workers have increased their productivity since 1983. However, they've been rewarded with lower real wages. How do you justify an administration that has rewarded workers in your employment with lower real wages? The Minister, Senator Evans. In public sector employment, as everywhere else in the community, such small increase in the dispersion of private incomes, as has been evident over the last decade and is frankly acknowledged in all the research, is absolutely reversed when you take into account the operation of the tax system, the operation of various forms of cash income support and the non-cash social wage benefits in health education and all the rest that we have been delivering. That's the way it works. Every single Order. safety net increase that I can recall being put before you has been the subject of either challenge or opposition. Absolutely no understanding of the way in which this system operates and how these benefits actually work to the advantage of the lower page has ever been evident in any of your thinking, any of your performance, any of your behaviour, and it's not evident now in any of the promises that you're making to the Australian community. You're not making any promises. You don't understand the way the system operates. The, Minister's the op way time the system expired. operates has been fundamentally fair and just for all Australian wage earners. Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to the Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen, perhaps for his last answer. Minister, you'd be aware of the concern in Japan about redback spiders, which uh, may have travelled in woodchip ships. Minister, in view of our obligations under GATT and the imbalance of our trade in pests, and recognising that woodchip ships have provided Australia with such things as the Northern Pacific Sea Star, dinoflagellates and several species of seaweed, is the export of the uh, redback a deliberate step by the government to fulfil our GATT obligations? If so, what are we sending in the next wood chip ship? Uh, a couple of uh, funnel web spiders, perhaps, and a few uh, Ross River mosquitoes, and perhaps a, uh, a uh, root rot nematode or uh, 
Will these be seen as uh, oh, primary exports, or are you going to go into a bit of downstream processing? <laughs> the Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Order. Order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we are. We may call for tenders for any suggestions to what we might send. If you'd like to nominate certain uh, candidates who are running against you in the election for inclusion, uh, we'd be quite prepared to give that serious consideration. Uh, but it's a very, it's a short list, so you'll have to get in very quickly, uh, Senator. Uh, the, uh, I have the, the only serious point I want to make in response to that profound and important question is I don't, I don't wish to acknowledge in any way that the source of any possible uh, red-backed spider infestation in the Japan is from Australia. It's very important that we don't. There's serious probability that it came from uh, other sources of timber because we are not the biggest timber product supplier to uh, Japan and we are not the only timber product supplier from Japan who uh, has a red back spider. So the, I don't actually seriously want to acknowledge that point because it may do us some damage. Although it's important to us, it's important to make clear Order, that uh, there's no current indication that the uh, alarmist publicity uh, uh, in Japan has had any impact on our trade uh, performance in the Osaka region. So, uh, but in addition to that, uh, for all the more substantial matters about uh, policy on the forests, I'd suggest you either listen to the statement the Prime Minister is making now or give it, or give it its serious and worthwhile attention at its conclusion and to the forest product statement that will be made tomorrow. Senator Campbell. President, my question is directed to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment um, when he stopped. <laughs> so, it's okay. um, I'm sure it was important. The teen unemployment rate, Minister, as you know, is currently 29 uh, per cent even higher than it was at the start of the Working Nation um, programs. How worse off we are is actually illustrated by the fact that after the annual influx of school leavers onto the jobs market in December last year, that's 1994, the rate was uh, but 27.7 per cent. Every December in the last decade, under your government's policies, the teen jobless rate has actually jumped an average of 4 per cent at the end of the school year. What fairy tale will you peddle to the 40,000 school leavers looking for work? but unable to find a job, who are destined to become officially unemployed in, uh, at the end of this month. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, uh, Senator Mr. Mr President, uh, first of all, I want to just again state uh, the, the true facts about this definition of uh, youth unemployment. I have said this before in the parliament, that uh, the, the full-time teenage unemployment rate is 29 per cent, but that does not mean that 29 per cent of Australian teenagers are unemployed. That's, that's because only 25 per cent of teenagers were available for full-time work in October. Uh, that's the last month we got the figures. 55 per cent were in school, 13 per cent were in full-time post-school education. What we should focus on is the 95,600 teenagers looking for full-time work which is 7.5 per cent of the total teenage population. It's worth noting, of course, Mr President, that uh, Labor has reduced this number from when John Howard was uh, Treasurer, when he had 158, no, no, when the population was a lot smaller, he had 158,000 teenagers in 1983 were out of, uh, didn't have a job, which amounted to over 12 per cent of the total teenagers. So, so again, Mr. President, I've said this before on behalf of the government. This consistent idea that 20, that 29% uh, of teenagers are out Order. of work is it is it is uh, it is to imply that all of those teenagers are seeking work is not true. However, now, S Senator Senator C Senator Campbell, uh, Senator Campbell. Order. Uh, Senator Campbell asked this question. I suppose he anticipates this may be the last question time uh, before the election. Uh, so he wants to try and have a hypothetical question about what the unemployment rate will be next year, what the number of, what the number of young people coming into the labour market will be late this year, early next year, at the end of the school year. Well, all I can say to you, uh, Senator Campbell, is I'm not going to speculate hypothetically what those figures would be, but I would say if it wasn't for the Working Nation uh, initiatives uh, going back to May last year, there would be a lot more unemployed uh, young people, there would be a lot more unemployed young people, and I'd also have to say is 
It is all very well for you to criticise us, and that is a political point you wish to make, but for goodness sake, please tell us what you would do specifically other than reduce youth wages to $3 an hour. <coughs> Supplementary, Senator Campbell. Mr. President, my question uh, was about um, what you would actually do for the 40,000 people. I don't think anyone around here is particularly interested in having a pedantic argument about how you define an ABS statistic. Most, most people, Minister and, and Senator Crowley, who seeks to interject, are very concerned about a crisis situation in youth unemployment, concerned that the Working Nation statement that did come in May last year has actually seen an increase in teen unemployment, no matter how you define it. But the reality is you've got 40,000 school leavers who are likely uh, destined to go onto the unemployment list. The coalition has already released a whole raft of detail about what it's going to do in economic policy, community employment programs and a whole range of other policies. So, so you might as well give up on that one. You happen to be in government Order. now, Minister. You happen to be in government now. You've been in power for 13 years and you've got the biggest youth unemployment crisis in this country's history. What we want to know is what do you propose the to Senator's do about it? You tried the nation and it failed. What are you going to tell these 40,000 young kids? The Minister, Senator Schott. Mr President, uh, in, these first, in the question that the first question Senator Campbell asked, he talked about fairy tales. Well, after listening to his supplementary. The only fair trial I can think of is a grim fairy tale, and it's the grim policies of the opposition, because you've got, you have offered none. You've said in your supplementary you've released a whole host of policies. I wish you would table them. We've got documents that have been leaked. All they talk about is attacking the government. They do not give one specific recommendation of how you would reduce youth unemployment in this country. The last one we can remember you talking about was three and a half years ago when you mentioned that you would have the youth wage at $3 an hour. Now, you have told us some that, that may not be the case. Now, all I can say to you, Senator, Order. you said we would like to see your policies in detail released because all you have ever done is criticised Working Nation, which has substantially reduced youth unemployment, long-term youth unemployment in Australia substantially Point. reduced the over the last time has couple expired. of years, and you have offered nothing the minister's in its place. The time has expired. Senator Margetts. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to the minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator, the Hon. Senator Evans. I refer to the minister to a letter from the Premier of South Australia to Order. the Prime Minister dated February 28, 1995, which states that the South Australian government Quote, does not accept the Commonwealth's decision to store the waste at Woomera Rangeland until certain assurances are given. The letter goes on to explain that these assurances are in relation to the federal government agreeing to discontinue the consideration of Lake Eyre for World Heritage listing. Did the federal government make any assurances that it would not proceed with the World Heritage listing of the Lake Eyre region to ensure that the South Australian government would become a temporary or permanent radioactive waste site or repository? If so, why was such an agreement made, given the current process to select a site for a permanent national repository? If not, can the minister assure the Senate that the World Heritage listing of the Lake Eyre will not be sacrificed in the name of an expedient solution to the radioactive waste storage problem? The Honourable Minister, Senator Evans. I thank the Honourable D. Margetts for her question. The government has not given any assurances that it will not proceed with the World Heritage Assessment process, nor does the government recognise any link between this issue and the issue of temporary storage of radioactive waste at Woomera Rangehead. My colleague, uh, extremely honourable Senator John uh, Faulkner, has made clear what the government's position is on the Lake Eyre assessment process. That is that no decision will be made on whether to proceed with the nomination until all relevant assessments have been completed. These include the natural values assessment, cultural values assessments and, if world heritage values are identified, a socio-economic impact study. As to the latter, the government is committed to seeing a full socio-economic impact study of a possible listing completed before any nomination goes forward, although I don't think it's appropriate to commence such a study before the assessment reports have ascertained whether world heritage values exist. Senator Collins and Senator Faulkner have commissioned the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics to prepare a socio-economic profile of the study area. When the Commonwealth Government has considered fully the results of these various assessments, the natural and cultural assessments of world heritage values, 
of the uh, South Australian section of the Lake Eyre Basin. It may then enter into negotiations with the South Australian Government in terms of the intergovernmental agreement on the environment in regard to a possible World Heritage nomination. So that's the process that is underway, and once again, I don't think there's any foundation for the honourable senator's fears. Supplementary, Senator Margetts. Um, I thank the, minute, the very honourable minister, but I, I wondered. Uh, originally, the South Australian government were reluctant to receive radioactive waste at St Mary's. They did. They did agree, I guess, reluctantly. What, um, what finally changed their mind, minister? The minister, Senator Evans. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, frankly. You'll have to ask them. Um, I'll take that question on notice. Yeah, well, they're a pretty scrappy sort of a government over there at the moment. Things have changed, of course, in recent times. But um, I'll see what further information I can get in, part, in response to that part of your question. Senator Chi. But, uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government of the Senate. Earlier this week, you told the Senate Mr Graham Campbell's anti-immigrant comments were disgusting. However, your colleague Mr Eric Fitzgibbon said Tuesday's caucus meeting had a majority in favour of Mr Campbell and if the Prime Minister had put the matter to the vote it would have been quote, quite embarrassing unquote, for Mr Keating. Furthermore, caucus chairman Mr Jim Snow said of Mr Campbell quote, he's got a lot of support in the Labor Party. He's got a lot of support in the community. A broad-based Labor Party ought to be able to accommodate people like Graham. What is going on in the Labor Party? Is it not the case that rather than finding Mr Campbell's comments disgusting, the majority of your Labor colleagues are happy to tolerate anything, condone anything, no matter how offensive, just to hold on to the seat of Kalgoorlie? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Well, it's right. rather pathetic to see uh, poor old Senator O'Chee trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear of an assault on this particular issue. It's obvious that uh, Mr Campbell's remarks have no sympathy whatsoever with the overwhelming majority of his caucus colleagues and of party members and, I believe, of people in the Australian community. How Mr Campbell is to be dealt with as a result of the positions that he's taken on this and other matters is a matter not for the caucus but for the party, the national executive of the party, which will be meeting tonight. I'm not going to preempt that process because it is proper that uh, procedures and processes be, uh, be followed that will produce a, a just result and just outcome. But uh, I think you can reasonably assume that the values that we have been articulating, that we have made preeminently our own in public life in this country, are not going to be allowed to be prejudiced or threatened uh, by positions being taken by people like uh, Mr Campbell. Those views are absolutely at odds with the view that we have of the character Order. of Australian society. Mr Fitzgibbon is departing our ranks uh, in this forthcoming uh, election, and Mr Fitzgibbon speaks for himself on this particular matter, as does Mr Order. Snow there are too or many interjections on both view. sides. Senator I'm Shot. not going to further canvass matters, Kemp. which are properly matters for the Senator party Kemp. machinery. Uh, but I don't think uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed about the well. You will be disappointed, I suspect, about the outcome that this matter will have, because uh, it may not give you the further information that you think you'd like to have going into an election campaign. In, in, sorry, uh, ammunition, which is utterly uh, inappropriate for you to be uh, flowing around, given the track record of your particular party. And, and uh, well. I wasn't going to be tasteless enough to uh, remind Senator O'Chee of the performance of his current leader in 1988, but that's the last time a serious figure in Australian politics seriously sought to play the race card. The fact that a fringe figure might seek to play such a card says Order. something about the fringe figure concern, but it says nothing about the mainstream Labor Party. A lot was said about the mainstream Liberal Party in those events of 1988, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Supplementary, Senator Mr. O'Chee. Mr. President, uh, earlier on this week, Senator Evans told me on Monday that there was nobody in the parliamentary Labor Party who shared Mr. Campbell's views on these matters. Now he says that they're shared by Mr. Snow and Mr. Fitzgibbon, the chairman of the caucus. How many others in the caucus share Order. these disgraceful, bigoted views? Order. And is Mr. Campbell's position in the parliamentary Labor Party endorsed and backed by Mr. Kim Beasley? The Minister, Senator Evans. Mr Snow's views, I know personally, are absolutely rock solid on issues of race and immigration. He's 
as conce he's concerned about a potential electoral backlash from a certain stream of opinion within his own electorate. He's expressed that view. That may well be the position that's been taken by Mr Fitzgibbon. They speak for themselves, but I didn't take them. I don't think any of my colleagues took them to be expressing views themselves, which were those views of Campbell. They were expressing the views that uh, they were views that. You know, they were taking the view that the party was a broad enough church to accommodate uh, some pretty bizarre and wild and woolly, uh, wild and woolly opinions. It's absolutely defamatory of those two people to suggest that they in any way shared Mr Campbell's views, as it's equally defamatory to suggest to the uh, deputy leader of the party that he would have any uh, willingness to give comfort to such views. <coughs> Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Cook, Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Uh, is the minister aware of claims by a South Australian small businessman of political interference in decisions of the CSIRO? And can the minister inform the Senate of the validity of these claims? The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Thank Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Yes, uh, I am aware of claims by a South Australian small businessman about uh, political interference in the decisions of the CSIRO. And I have here a statutory declaration sworn by Mr David Paul Battersby uh, to that effect, which I now table. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, the David Mr David Battersby runs a small advertising company in Adelaide. The statutory declaration relates to events last year after he had reached agreement with the CSIRO to erect advertising billboards on the CSIRO's property at O'Halloran's Hill in the Adelaide uh, southern suburbs. The CSIRO has confirmed Mr Batterby's claim that shortly before the contracts were finalised, Ms Chris Gallus, the member for Hindmarsh, contacted the CSIRO, complaining that a number of other advertising companies had not been informed of the arrangement. According to the CSIRO, and in their normally understated terms, they said, the strong impression given was that Ms Gallus would actively canvass against the proposals. Mr Battersby found out about this intervention indirectly. He found out through a large Adelaide advertising company and, as a consequence, he then rang Ms Gallus. In his statutory declaration, Mr Battersby states, and I quote, she, meaning in this case Mr President, Ms Gallus, told me that the project was dead and would not go ahead, stating that she had previously been on some CSIRO review board and had a lot of powerful friends at CSIRO who had ensured her assured her uh, our contract would be terminated. In the statutory declaration, he goes on referring to Ms Gallus, saying this, these words to him, and I quote, whilst I don't like to see anyone go bankrupt, from where I sit, I just sent you under, you're playing in the big league now, unquote. Well, Mr President, uh, it is interesting to ask the question, why has Ms Gallus uh, got an interest in ending this project? She told the CSIRO that it was to give other companies a chance to bid for the contract to erect hoardings. But when the matter was raised in the parliament last year, she told the House of Representatives that it, that it was, and I quote, on the basis of my well-known interest in the environment, unquote. Not only did she, she not mention the issues of the other companies in the parliament, she said, and I quote again, neither I nor anyone else could have had anything of a commercial nature to gain in this matter, unquote. Mr President, the two explanations are not consistent. If indeed the environment was her concern, as she told the parliament, then there could be no way that she could entertain anyone putting up a billboard in that location. But in fact, she told the CSIRO her concern was of the commercial aspects of the contract that had led her to, get into, led her to, to become involved. Now, I think uh, what we have to consider against this background, Mr President, is that during the 1993 election, Ms Gallus had a number of large billboards around her electorate, some in choice locations which were provided by two of Adelaide's large billboard advertising firms, and these same firms are also recorded in the Liberal Party's 1992-3 declaration of expenditure as having made donations to the Liberal Party. O'Halloran's Hill is, by the way, in the seat of Kingston, which does not even adjoin Hindmarsh, and Ms Gallus was the shadow minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the Order. time. Mr President, the situation that I have now reported uh, before me in, in a statutory declaration by an Adelaide small businessman is that Ms Gallus brought pressure to bear on the CSRO to terminate a commercial contract, and this then misrepresented her motives in a uh, statement in the House of Representatives. 
now that there is a statutory declaration before me, as Minister for Science and uh, responsible for the CSIRO at ministerial level, I, I uh, will investigate this matter time has to the full. <coughs> Senator, Senator Woodley. Mr. President, my, uh, <coughs> my question is addressed to Senator Faulkner. Oh. Uh, he seemed a little disturbed before that he wasn't getting a question, so this may restore his confidence. Is the minister aware of the report by Traffic Oceana that significant amounts of traditional Chinese medicine sold in Australia contain ingredients from threatened species such as tiger, bear, rhino and leopards? Does the minister support the commercial trade in products derived from endangered wildlife? Given that there has been evidence for some time of the use of threatened species in medicine sold in Australia, why has the Commonwealth Government allowed this trade to continue unabated? And what is the Federal Government doing to halt this trade which is causing an ongoing, ongoing threat to many threatened species? The Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, I am aware of uh, the, the many uh, views that have been expressed uh, to Government uh, on this issue, and I am uh, aware, as uh, I hear regularly from the peak conservation organisations, uh, including representative. In, well, maybe, maybe you might be right, uh, Senator Alston. I think, and I suspect all those communications, Senator Alston, are going to be congratulatory ones. Uh, uh, the, uh, I can say, uh, I can say to uh, Senator Woodley that. Uh, I can say to Senator Woodley that uh, that, uh, that includes, of course, uh, representatives of uh, Traffic Oceana. I also might say uh, to uh, Senator Woodley that uh, we have debated at great length uh, the issues that uh, you have raised in your questions recently uh, in this uh, chamber, as no doubt uh, you are aware. When I outlined, I think, in very great detail the very responsible uh, attitude that this government has taken uh, to uh, such trade in, uh, in uh, these products. Now, Senator, uh, I really do think that the, the government's record in this area uh, is uh, beyond uh, criticism. I do believe, I do believe that, uh, that uh, nearly all in the conservation movement and more broadly in the community have accepted uh, that this government has uh, really has really ensured that uh, its responsibilities under the CITES uh, convention uh, have been dealt with uh, seriously and responsibly we've ensured that uh, that the legislative framework that we have in place in Australia does reflect those uh, responsibilities, and I can assure you, uh, in the future, Senator, that we are going to apply ourselves uh, with as much rigour as uh, we have uh, over recent years, whenever uh, matters of importance uh, are raised uh, in relation to uh, trade uh, in endangered uh, species. I, I do think that the record of the government. Is, uh, is beyond criticism. Australia is perceived in relation to this issue as being a leader in the international community. And, uh, and I think that is accepted far more broadly than just uh, senators uh, or members uh, on this side of the House. Our record's outstanding, Senator. It's acknowledged by nearly all. And I'd be very disappointed, Senator, if you weren't one of those that acknowledge the efforts that I've made as Minister and this government has made in relation to this important issue. Supplementary, Senator Woodley. I do acknowledge your efforts. Whether they are adequate is the question, uh, Minister. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask a, f a further question in terms of uh, trade in endangered species and ask whether the federal government recently moved to relax restrictions on the export of skins from saltwater crocodiles which I believe is still an endangered species here in Australia, and if so, why? Minister, Senator Faulkner. Look, Senator, this particular issue has been one that I've, uh, I've taken very seriously. It's been raised at the Australian and New Zealand Environment and Conservation Council meeting. There has been a proposition for the Northern Territory uh, that, uh, that uh, 
we, uh, we take a different approach in relation to rogue crocodiles, uh, particularly, and uh, with a, a very, uh, a very uh, a stringent uh, set of conditions that uh, I have applied, I have uh, enabled that uh, trade to take place. It doesn't, of course, uh, affect many uh, individual uh, specimens at all, and I'm happy, if it would be of interest to you, uh, Senator, to provide you a copy of, uh, of uh, the conditions that uh, I've placed on uh, the Northern Territory uh, in relation to this particular uh, matter, and I can assure you that uh, the moves that I made after very careful consideration and advice from the Australian Nature Conservation Agency is an Minister's approach that has been time has uh, accepted and endorsed by conservation organisations in this country. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Gareth Evans, the Leader of the Government in the Senate. And, uh, I ask Senator e Evans, will the Government unequivocally rule out using any money appropriated by the Parliament in 1995 for the payment of costs awarded against Dr Lawrence and the legal costs for Dr Lawrence's court challenges to the Marks Royal Commission. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, uh, Senator Evans. Well, Mr President, the Minister of Finance has already addressed that question in Parliament yesterday and I think given you a straightforward answer on it. Supplementary, Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr President. I draw, the, uh, I, I draw Senator Gareth Evans' uh, attention to the AAP uh, article of, of yesterday's date, which says, it is understood the government is considering whether it could pay Order. for much of the challenge costs out of the change left over from the appropriation bill to be approved. And I asked, the, uh, I asked uh, Senator Evans what he, say, what he says about that. The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, I haven't said anything about that, and I don't propose to say anything now. I mean, the 243. The 200, no, the two, no, the $243,000 in round figures that is attributable to Dr Lawrence's costs her lawyers before the various courts that are involved in those collateral challenges has been withdrawn from that appropriation as a result of your amendment in the House of Representatives. And uh, we're not proposing to, as I've said and Mr Beasley has made clear, we're not proposing to further pursue uh, ways of paying that particular amount until after Parliament has had a chance to further uh, consider that issue. The 243000 that's uh, that's attributable to uh, Dr Lawrence's uh, cost of her own lawyers in those collateral proceedings. I've made that clear. Mr Beasley's made that clear. If Laura Tingle or someone else in the AAP or somewhere was suggesting something different, well, they've got the bull by the wrong horn. Senator Childs. Mr President, my question is directed to the Minister for Sport, Senator Faulkner. Can the Minister confirm to the Senate that last night he signed a sporting cooperation agreement with his South African counterpart, Mr Steve Sweaty? What is the significance of this agreement with South Africa? How does the minister expect that sporting contact with South Africa will strengthen in coming years, and how will these sporting contacts foster a firmer relationship between the two countries? The Minister for Sport, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, and I can uh, inform the Senate that the uh, Australian government is currently hosting a visit by the South African sports minister, Steve Schwetti. It, uh, it's a familiarisation visit, but it's covering matters such as uh, our sports development programs, uh, elite training uh, facilities and possibilities, and preparation for the Atlanta and uh, Olympic uh, Games uh, and Sydney Olympic Games. Mr. President, uh, I'm also uh, pleased that I was able to sign a memorandum of understanding yesterday on sporting cooperation between South Africa and Australia. Uh, we have several of these types of agreement, particularly uh, with uh, Asian countries, uh, and they're designed, uh, from our perspective, to uh, enhance Australia's sporting profile and build on our host status for the 2000 Olympics. Uh, in the case uh, of South Africa, our, uh, our agreement, of course, is designed to facilitate uh, their re-entry into world sport in a way that uh, enhances multiracial participation in sport at both the grassroots and the elite levels. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's natural for South Africa to turn to Australia for assistance in this regard. There, uh, there are a range of circumstances, not the least uh, of which is, uh, is uh, the fact that uh, 
that uh, we have a, a, a southern hemisphere location, which really do uh, strengthen our relationship. But more importantly, I think we share some very uh, strong uh, common traditions in sports such as rugby union and uh, cricket. And, uh, and I've got no doubt we're going to have a, a strengthening relationship uh, in sport over the coming years with South Africa, particularly in the lead up to the 2000 Olympics. At the uh, signing ceremony with Mr Shweti, uh, he informed me in fact that this agreement was the first government to government agreement, the first bilateral agreement that the Australian government has signed with the new South African government of national unity. And uh, it's also the first international agreement that South Africa has entered into in the field of sport. And I think that both of those mark uh, very significant uh, events indeed. I think the uh, agreement will uh, allow both countries to work uh, on, on fostering the very close uh, uh, ties that have been developed since uh, democratic elections were held in South Africa uh, in 1994. Uh, the Australian Sports Commission has uh, worked closely with uh, Mr Shweti's uh, ministry uh, and the National Sports Council of South Africa in re-establishing South Africa sport in the post-apartheid era. Uh, senators uh, may also uh, be aware of uh, the very uh, positive role that's been played by Australian teams when they visited South Africa. Particularly our rugby union and our, our cricket teams have taken a very active role in visiting the black townships and, uh, and involving themselves in clinics and training sessions. And, uh, Mr Shweti assured me that uh, that has resulted in really an enduring uh, affection for uh, Australians and Australian sport uh, as a result. Uh, thanks uh, to the uh, generous assistance in this case of uh, AusAid, the Sports Commission has got an officer on secondment in South Africa who is in assisting in the development of the Protea uh, sport program. That's really an adaption of the Aussie sports uh, program in Australia. It's, uh, it's a highly successful uh, uh, participation program being introduced in the townships uh, of South Africa. I can assure the Senate that Australian uh, sport uh, and Australian sporting in South Africa are extraordinarily strong. Senator Teague. Yeah. Senator Teague? Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Senator, Senator, Senator Evans. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. I refer to the treaty between Bosnia, Croatia and Serbia, initialed at Dayton, Ohio, earlier this month which offers the best prospect for an implemented peace to emerge in all these horrendous years of warfare. What is the Australian government doing to strengthen the prospects of the treaty's implementation? In particular, I ask about UN sanctions and the conditional terms of the treaty for suspension of sanctions. Can Australia suspend sanctions temporarily or conditionally? If not, what is the timing and nature of Australia's action on this matter during the coming month? Also, insofar as the lifting of sanctions for one party to the treaty is conditional on alleged war criminals being actually handed over for trial by the International War Crimes Tribunal, what does the Australian government intend to do if sanctions need to be reimposed? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator, T uh, well, Senator Evans. Mr President, my, my recollection is that there is a submission on my desk at the moment addressing the question of sanctions, which I haven't yet got to, so I'm not quite sure what it says, but I think uh, we're in a position to uh, respond now at least partially to uh, a sanctions lifting exercise, but I'll need to take that part of the question on notice and uh, give Senator Teague a, a better answer. I'm happy to do that as soon as possible, probably later today. Um, as to more generally as the question of Australian participation in the implementation of a settlement, while we've uh, monitored developments in the conflict very closely and while individual Australians have obviously made a contribution, including with a number of humanitarian operations on the ground, Australia hasn't had a direct role in the peace process. We believed all along that the regional powers, in cooperation with the United Nations and especially with some help from the United States, were the best place to pursue a settlement. We don't rule out making an appropriate post-settlement contribution in line with our approach until now, in which we've um, spoken out strongly against human rights violations, both bilaterally and in forums such as the General Assembly and the uh, Committee on Human Rights. We've supported the international community's peace efforts. We've provided humanitarian assistance in the region—7.7 .7 million, in fact, to the former Yugoslavia since the outbreak of the conflict. 
and uh, provided resettlement opportunities in Australia, to date some 14,000 persons, with provisions being made for an additional 7,600 this year. We have also actively supported the operations of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We have conscientiously applied UN sanctions to the extent that they have continued to be applicable, and we will we'll go on doing all those things. We haven't proposed, however, nor has there been any official approach about us playing a more direct and substantial role in either the peace implementation force or in the post-settlement reconstruction effort. And with that, uh, Mr. President. Oh, supplementary, okay. Senator T. <laughs> Order. Order. La last question. Last question to uh, Senator Evans. Ever in the Senate. Ever anywhere. Order. 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 Senator T. He'll be asking the Mr. next year. Mr. President, um, before the minister is uh, asking questions himself uh, in a few months' time, um, I, I come back, back to that part of my question, which related to war criminals, Order. and I put to the minister that this is the first international treaty which directly addresses the seriousness of war criminals being brought to trial, and that element of the treaty uh, does see sanctions being reimposed on any party if the war criminals, uh, alleged war criminals, are not handed over for, to face trial before the International War Crimes Tribunal. Uh, is the minister uh, sure that we will be able to pay our part uh, as Australia in making sure that that important part of the, of the treaty is implemented? The Minister, Senator Evans. I mean, you don't appreciate the sentimentality of this moment. I mean, I'm obviously deeply moved by it, but let me just say this. We, um, we obviously believe that those indicted for war crimes in the former Yugoslavia, as elsewhere, must be brought to justice, and those who deserve to be indicted, of whom there are many because of the shocking circumstances we're all familiar with, deserve to be brought to justice. We will continue to play our part in ensuring that happens, including through observing any sanctions uh, conditionality strictures of the kind that you've mentioned. We were, in fact, one of the very first countries to take domestic legislative action to enable us to provide relevant assistance to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Slavia, and you can absolutely expect us to maintain that record in the future. And with that, uh, Mr. President, perhaps for the very last time, I ask that uh, further questions be placed on notice. <laughs> Senator Schott. Mr. President, uh, on the 22nd of November 1995, Senator McGibbon asked me two questions about the performance specifications in the Coast Watch, co Coast Watch contract and also asked me to release the contract for public scrutiny. To say the time of the Senate, I wish to incorporate the answer of which a copy has already been given to Senator McGibbon. The Senate should note that I table several documents which are material to the answer and which will also be incorporated. <coughs> Is leave granted to incorporate? Leave is granted. Senator, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I uh, provide uh, this information in relation to the question that Senator Lees asked uh, of me yesterday about whether the government has hired a consultant to uh, convince the Australian people that uh, the soon-to-be-announced decision on uh, the deferred forest areas will be a good decision. And, uh, and, uh, I make uh, the following uh, statement in relation to uh, that particular question. Uh, information relating to uh, this forest decision is being coordinated by the Forest Task Force in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. The Forest Task Force is made up from officials from the Department uh, of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Department of Environment, Sport and Territories, the Australian Nature Conservation Agency, the uh, Australian Heritage Commission, the Department of Primary Industries and Energy, the Bureau of Resource Sciences and the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics. The task force, Mr. President, has not hired uh, the services of a public relations consultant to assist in the public presentation of the forest decision. Order. Uh, yesterday at question time, there was some debate about whether a statement by Senator Cook, uh, directed to another senator. Sorry, you. Couple of further oh, sorry. answers. No, you, you do your I think stress. it I'll might be appropriate that. if we do this. Very brief statement. Uh, yesterday, Senator, Senator Shamaret asked me a question without notice about ATSIC. Since she's not in the chamber, perhaps I can seek leave to incorporate the answer in hand, sir. Is leave granted? Leave is granted.
Mr President, on 6 June 1995, I gave a preliminary answer to a question without notice from Senator Wheelwright relating to a number of allegations made in the Parliament on 5 June by Mr Ken Aldred, MP, concerning pedophile activities by officers of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I am now in a position to advise him and the Senate as to the outcomes of the police investigations that have subsequently taken place. Mr President, this is quite a long uh, response, and I again seek leave to incorporate that in hand, so that's the wish of the Senate. Granted. Leave, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. <laughs> Yesterday at question time, there was some debate about whether a statement by Senator Cook directed to another senator was uh, unparliamentary. I took the comment to be, and I quote, uh, what you are saying is false. Uh, on examining the Hansard transcript, I find that the expression used was, you know what you are saying is false. This is clearly unparliamentary since it involves an implication that a senator is deliberately making false statements, and I apologise for this uh, error of interpretation. It did, however, have no bearing on the statement that I made last week on the misuse of proper names to circumvent uh, Standing Order 193. Senator Vanstone? You, uh, probably take note of your statement. It might be a good you're moving to take note of my yes. statement. Well, you're I've moving to make, take note of my statement. Uh, Mr. President, I uh, am grateful for your response, but I just invite you to consider a number of things uh, that, are, that I think are very important for people to understand, uh, if they are to have confidence that what is said on one side is treated equally uh, when it's said on another side. Now, I understand from what you've just said that you understood what uh, the minister had said to be. Uh, a simple statement, what you're saying is false. And I could readily accept that. With all the din and clatter that goes on in this place, it would be easy to not hear the uh, first two words of his statement, uh, you know. So it would be easy to hear it as what you're saying is false rather than what he did say, which is you know what you're saying is false. That would be the case, Mr President, if the point of order hadn't been raised with you, uh, which I did, and quite specifically said to you uh, yet you have allowed the minister to say, you know what you're saying is false. I went on and pointed out that was a clear imputation uh, against all of this side because it was a clear inference that, that the people on this side knew what they were saying was false. Now We then had some uh, interchange because I think you were suggesting I hadn't understood what you'd said uh, the week before in relation to another matter. And uh, I indicated that, that that wasn't what I was saying, and I actually put it to you. What would you say? I said on a separate point of order. I rise on a further point of order, accepting what you ruled in the first time. What would you say, Mr. President, if I said to you, "You know what you're saying is false"? In other words, accepting that there might be some misunderstanding of what was said, but then trying on a point of order to get clarification on what I thought had actually been said, and we now know actually had been said. And your response to me then, when the second time it was put to you that the question was, can you say you know what you're saying is false, that was that you would treat it with disdain. And when I asked you, would you ignore it, you repeated uh, your point and said, I would treat it with the disdain that it deserves. It was only when the matter was taken up again later in the afternoon we find that Senator Evans even couldn't manage to avoid what was staring people in the face, and that is if you say you know what you're saying is false, it's tantamount to calling someone a liar. And he put to you this way, if the remark, as it turns up in hindsight, actually is you know what you said is false, we might have to look at it, etc. etc. And uh, at that point you said, as I've said, I'm happy to have a look at it. I certainly concede the point that you raised. Now, Mr President, if you can explain to me why, when I raised it with you twice, including the preamble to the statement, you know what you're saying is false, why do you treat it with disdain when I raise it and with some respect when the leader on the other side raises it? Senator Evans. <coughs> do I need leave or are we taking note? I'll seek. It's, uh, you, she moved to take note. So She's so moved to take just, note. Speak. Look, it's a fact of life in politics that some of us are graceless some of the time. But Senator Vanston, frankly, is graceless far too much of the time and has been again on this occasion. You, Mr President, got up, had a proper look at the Hansard, checked your recollection and the record as to what happened, and came in and made a perfectly graceful acknowledgement of error yesterday in the way in which you'd initially responded to the matters put to you. That error was based clearly 
on a mishearing of the original thing, and I suspect that mishearing carried through into the subsequent exchanges that took place with Senator Vanstone. You've acknowledged the force of the basic point that's in issue here, that if you'd make a, a statement that someone on the other side knows something he or she is saying is false, that is manifestly unparliamentary. That's the matter in issue. That's the matter that you clarified perfectly well by Order. a statement today. And any further attempt to pursue this by Senator Vanston is simply graceless, Senator. And I think you, Mr President, should not trouble yourself with further responding on the matter accordingly. Senator Cook. I leave. In view of your ruling, I withdraw my statement of yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. In brief, in brief response to explain, I think the confusion was caused by the fact that you'd order that Senator Vanstone, you did relate the matter to the statement that I had made last week, and that was the point that I took up. I concede that I was incorrect in not responding favourably to the point that you raised earlier. The person who made it clear was not, in fact, Senator Evans, but Senator Bohm, in a very clear distinction between the two statements. And I thought he explained it very fully, and that was when I was prepared to concede. And Senator Evans then, uh, then uh, supported that. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Oh, sorry. The, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. <coughs> Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I move the Senate take note of the answer of Senator Evans to Senator Noel, uh, and I also want to comment on Senator Evans' answer to, to my question. Because both, uh, both matters really, I think, uh, um, relate to uh, aspects of the record of this government which I think will go down in, in history as demonstrating not only its incompetence but the way in which it's let the Australian people down. The two, uh, the two issues are really the ongoing mass unemployment and underemployment that we have in this country, for which uh, many Australians uh, will remember the, the role of this, uh, this government. Over 600,000 Australians are still out of work. Uh, and secondly, the legacy for so many who have been in work that, in fact, their real wages under Labor uh, have fallen. Uh, and in this instance, in this instance today, although the Labor Party laughs about it, this instance today, what I was referring to, were the lower income levels within the public service, the employees of the government itself, it, those within direct responsibility of the government. And we now know, in fact, that the incomes of so many, in real terms, under Labor administration, have fallen. And uh, I, I wouldn't be proud of that if I was a Labor member of this place. I would be embarrassed by it. And I have no doubt, I have no doubt that the Australian people, when they face up to the choices at the next election, when they look at the record of this government, both on unemployment and on falling real wages, they will have only but one choice, and that's to, uh, to vote you out. Look at the figures of unemployment. Sadly, sadly, we've been through the cycle. We've had our five minutes of sunshine. Uh, we, we take us back to the last election, a min million unemployed. We had our five minutes of sunshine, some economic growth for a little while, economic growth that would have been sufficient to really eat into unemployment, and unfortunately the figures have now turned around again. Unemployment is on the rise. It bottomed out at 8.3 per cent. It's now risen steadily to 8.5 per cent. As I said, over 600,000 Australians still out of work. But what about the unemployment rate for young people? Three times that the rate for adults. And unfortunately, that's on the rise again as well. Bottomed out at 27.1 per cent in February, since then risen to 28.1 per cent. 92,000 Australian adolescents out of work. 92,000 young people in this country who are wanting work and unable to obtain work under the policies of the Australian, uh, Australian Labor Party. And of course, if we look in the regions, the position is, uh, is much worse. It, for adults, unemployment rates up around 13, 14 per cent. For young people, unemployment rates up around 30 and 40 per cent. No doubt, no doubt why, why so many within the regions of Australia are angry about the record of this government. But for those who have been fortunate enough to be able to maintain employment during this uh, period, they, they're, uh, they're, uh, they've got little to be grateful for to this government as well. And I really do think it's fascinating, because if you ever would have thought that this government would, would respond positively to one sector of the community, 
it would have been to its own public servants. And these, this document that I referred to out of the Public Service Union, which refers to the redistribution of uh, salaries within the public service under Labor from the workers to management, is really quite, uh, quite enlightening, Madam Deputy President. When you look at the lower levels of salary within the public service, right from the bottom levels up to nearly $30,000, 28850 from an ASO1 up to an ASO6, we see falls in real income of between 9.6 per cent and 14.8 per cent since 1983. So up to, up to nearly 15 per cent fall in real income during the period of this Labor government. The middle income range is the public service, 29,000 to 35,000, still falls, but smaller, between 5 and 1.2 per cent. But for the better off in the public service, Labor's record is to have given them rises in real terms of between 11 and 33 per cent. So it's the same picture whether you're in the public service or the private sector under this government. The record has been for Australian workers, lower income workers, their wages have dropped so much for the unions, so much for the accord. The record of Labor is their wages have dropped, but for the better off, the well paid, their rate wages have risen. That's what you ought to be so embarrassed about, because the record of Labor has been the richest Order, Senator, richer your time and the has poorer expired. the poorer, and Senator it's something McKenna. about which you should be concerned. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I'm very pleased that Senator Hill did indeed ask uh, Senator Evans this question and enable Senator Evans to put some good news on the record of this parliament. Senators, honourable senators would be aware that we have actually have currently got two Senator Evanses in this chamber, one of whom has not been uh, with us in the past few days. I have it on very good authority that Senator Christ Christopher Evans is actually sleeping at the moment after going through uh, tra traumatic experiences which uh, uh, he uh, and others who are parents would uh, know what they are. I've got the uh, pleasure of announcing to the Senate that this morning at 1.45 Western Standard Time, Senator Evans's wife Miriam gave birth to Declan at the, uh, the weight of eight pounds, five ounces. Uh, Declan is very well, Miriam is very well, and there is some hope that Christopher Evans will uh, survive the experience as well. I'm sure all senators will join uh, me and uh, indeed yourself, uh, Deputy President, wishing all of the Evans family all the very best for the future. Question is, the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. The same, same matter. Yes. Senator Knowles. Thank you very much. I mean, <laughs> no, I can't quite understand the relativity of what Senator McKeon just said to the to the horrendous answer that Senator Evans gave to both uh, myself and to Senator Hill in related questions. Because, I mean, Senator Gareth Evans, the one who is temporarily here. And, uh, but the point that was being made, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, during question time is the plight of the battlers in Australia, the way in which their real incomes have gone down under 13 years of this government. And to think that average incomes in the poorest households in Australia have dropped under 13 years of this government by nearly $8,000 is nothing short of appalling. And to think they don't even blush about it. They just make more and more excuses about it. And, and, and yes, that's quite right, Senator. He'll actually feel quite good about it. They're quite relaxed about it. They're equally relaxed that the, to know that the income of 70 per cent of Australian households has fallen. Now, to think that this is a, 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 a political party who supposedly prides itself on looking after the battlers, they couldn't have done a worse job if they'd tried. To let 70 per cent of household incomes drop over 13 years is just appalling and a disgrace, and let them go to the people and let the people decide. To think that after 13 years as well, they've put 750,000 households into the battler category. Now, the best estimates that you can get, the very best estimates you can get, is that there will be uh, over one million battler households by the year 2000. That is only five years away, four years away, and here they are, quite happy to come in here and have the leader of the government in the Senate saying that that is quite satisfactory and there is nothing wrong with it. To think that this is a political party 
whose Prime Minister only a handful of years ago said that no child would ever live in poverty. And what's happened? Instead of keeping to that promise and breaking that promise, they've left 600,000 children in poverty. 600,000 children in poverty and 760,000 people are out of work. And of course, the 767,000 people is a fictitious figure as well. Because what this mob have done is they've simply taken them off the unemployment queues, put them into all of these other programs where they don't show up on the unemployment queues. And the fact of the matter is that most of those people who are out there sadly still aren't getting jobs. They're doing these training courses or whatever. We're not saying for one moment that they shouldn't be trained, but they should get a job at the end of it. And what you've failed to deliver is the job at the end of it. What you've also managed to, to uh, achieve is the fact that um, as an article in the Financial Review said recently, the pain is really showing in the, those low-income households, because where, they, where are they getting their money from? The reality is that they're getting their money from uh, uh, their savings. They're using their savings. They're using their capital in every way, shape, and form. They're borrowing money from, from their parents, from their brothers and sisters, from relatives from anyone they can possibly borrow from. They're hocking themselves to their eyeballs. They're having garage sales. They're selling off their assets because you and the Labor Party, Senator uh, uh, Murphy, <laughs> thank you, Senator Murphy, have let these very people down. And you should be ashamed of yourselves to go out of the, the last election saying that you are not going to increase taxes when you have clearly increased taxes right across the board and you have left these people worse off than ever before. And anyone who is running any of these garage sales, pawn shops or whatever, they know the people who are bringing their household goods in day in, day out. Why? To pay the bills, to pay to put bread on the table. And you say that you're proud of your achievements. You should be utterly ashamed of that achievement to say that you have 70 per cent of Australian households worse off than they were when you came to office 13 years ago. Senator Jacinta Collins. On the same matter, Madam Deputy President, I'm glad that uh, Senator Hill and Senator Knowles have referred to the issue of falling real wages and falling incomes, because I now have the opportunity to put those issues into context. And the context is that you shouldn't take those declining factors solely on their own. The factor that uh, is conveniently overlooked by both Senator Knowles and Senator Hill is the increases in the social wage that have occurred under this government. The importance of the social wage factors in any discussion on income distribution has been raised on several occasions, and I'm surprised that it is still continually overlooked by senators from the other side, such as Senator Knowles and Senator Hill. It was only earlier this week that uh, Senator Crowley, in question time, referred to uh, perhaps a more contextual and relevant analysis of where Australia stands in terms of how it looks after the Aussie battler. Research by Dr Peter Whitford in his paper Family Benefits and Taxes Support for Children in a Comparative Perspective, which was published in uh, the June issue of the Social Security Journal and reported on by uh, Ross Giddens in Saturday's Sydney Morning Herald, shows a much fairer comparison of where Australia stands with respect to the position of the Aussie battler. Ross Gittin says, as with forms of income, or sorry, I make that point, as with forms of income, to make fair comparisons between countries, you have to take account of all forms of assistance, not just some of them, as have been conveniently referred to uh, by members of the opposition when the figures suit them. By international standards, our system treats low-income families very well, but high-income families aren't treated well at all. And though our system isn't particularly generous in its treatment of middle-income families, its performance is above international standards on average. In Australia's case, the gap between two incomes couples' net incomes is 1.8 times compared with the gap of three times for their gross incomes. So the effect of our family assistance system has been to reduce the dispersion of their incomes by 40 per cent. And our system does more to direct assistance to low-income families than any other, any other system examined. 
Ross Gittin's comments that we could make our system more generous to high-income families, but only by making it less generous to low-income families. Ross Gittin says it doesn't sound like the right way to go to me. It doesn't sound like the right way to go to me either, but it appears that the sorts of assistance that the opposition would like to put forward would be factored more towards higher income families. Let me conclude my comments in this debate by putting to Senator Knowles and Senator Hill the comments by Bob Santa Maria that I raised uh, answering Senator Abetz's issues in relation to my submissions to the Lions Forum because I think they accurately reflect what I think is the policy position which uh, has been put by the Lions Forum with respect to families and seems to be the only indication of opposition policy that we can find. Bob Santa Maria pointed out the contradictions between economic rationalism with its stress on individuals maximising his interests and pro-family rhetoric. Santa Maria said, I resent it when people talk about giving the family priority and then pursue economic policies that cut the family's throat. The inconsistencies with opposition's policies are quite obvious, even to conservative commentators like Bob Santa Maria. And uh, I think it's fairly hypocritical to hear the comments that are raised to, uh, to the answers of Senator Evans in question time and uh, rely on the more relevant statistics that I've put before the Senate just now. Senator Newman. Mr. President, the same matter. I wish to join in the uh, uh, debate on this issue because last night I read an article in the Australian Medicine magazine which documented how six million Australians are either entitled to or dependent upon a health care card, and that does not include a dependence of the Department of Veterans Affairs. If ever there was a statistic that was telling about the low income and living standards of Australian households, surely that statistic tells a terrible tale because it means that one third of all Australians have, are living in families with incomes so low that they have to be supported with a health care card, with this welfare measure. Is that, is that a measure of Australian living standards that this Labor government is proud of? Senator Murphy. A different matter, Madam Deputy yes. President. A different matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the qu question is that the Senate take note of that answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Minchin. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I wish to take note of Senator um, Evans' answer to uh, Senator Ralston's question about the state of the economy. Um, Senator Evans was breathtaking in his arrogance and, frankly, ignorance about the economy in his answer today. He described the economy as in great shape. He said that the fundamentals of the Australian economy are as rock solid as they've ever been. It was the most extraordinary answer. Now, one of the things that struck me is that it, do it really doesn't matter what the state of the Australian economy is, the government will always say it's in terrific shape or that what's happening is on course and according to forecasts, etc. Um, when we went into recession in 19 90 thereabouts. The, the, the government said, well, that's terrific. We've got to have this recession. This is exactly what the Australian economy needs. This is to be expected. This is what we want. Then when the uh, economy recovered and we had a, a brief period of growth of 6 per cent, which everyone knew was completely unsustainable under this government's policies, the government said, this is fantastic. Isn't this great? We've got the best growth in the world. Now the growth, as is evidenced by the national accounts yesterday, is back down to half of that just over 3 per cent. Well, that's terrific as well. I mean, it really doesn't matter what the state of the economy is. You think it's fantastic. I mean, you absolutely have no credibility when you come to comment on the economy. And Senator Evans, in particular, who many regard as having no knowledge of economics, is equally without any credibility at all. The government, in the form of the, uh, the minister in here representing the prime minister, is completely blind to the economic realities facing 18 million Australians. The economy is not in great shape. It is in very bad shape, as revealed yesterday by the national accounts. And the worst part about it is the callous disregard which the government clearly has for the three quarters of a million Australians who remain unemployed under your policies, to the 8.7 per cent of the workforce who cannot get a job under your policies. The fact that that unemployment rate is actually increasing. Uh, I gave. Uh, evidence yesterday about the National Institute of Labor Studies findings, which show that the government has no hope of achieving its 5 per cent unemployment target 
by the year 2000. The best they think we can achieve by the year 2000 is about 7.5 per cent, and even that will require a growth rate of over 3.5 per cent, which you are not achieving on the basis of the national accounts, which Senator Evans show are in terrific shape. They give a growth rate of 3.3 per cent, which means that unemployment will continue to rise. And more Australians will be out of work. Many economists have commented on the basis of those figures that unemployment will be over 9 per cent by the early part of next year. I mean, the economic realities are thus. We have massive foreign debt. Uh, as um, we heard from, uh, about Bob Santa Maria, well, the News Weekly, which of course he's responsible for, says about um, the state of the economy as follows. Australians net foreign liabilities, which include both the foreign debt and foreign equity in Australian companies, are now the third highest in the world. Out of all the economies in the world, we have the third worst position of all when it comes to net foreign liabilities. Last year we had the highest peacetime deficit on the balance of current account at $24,000 million. Next year we are promised by the Federal Treasurer that the balance on current account will amount to $27 billion. Another record. The economy is in dreadful shape on that basis. We have chronic budget deficits. The government cannot produce a budget surplus. The surplus it boasted about, which was always a false surplus, not, won't even become a surplus on the basis of its uh, false accounting. We, inflation is starting to rise again. We have chronically low savings rates. No wonder Rupert Murdoch described the economy as a complete disgrace. No wonder the economists said that Australia is an emerging economy which is the next Mexico and which combines a third world economy with a first world Order standard Senator, of living. Your time has expired. Same matter or another one? The question is the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer from Senator Cook to my question with regards to uh, the polit political interference uh, of a CSRO decision as relate to a small businessman in South Australia. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, this uh, is a very serious matter, and it is clearly the case that a member of the other House, Mrs Gallus, did interfere and cause uh, the CSIRO to terminate an agreement they had with a small businessman who was entering into the advertising field and could well have caused him to go bankrupt. Mrs Gallus does acknowledge and admits that she sought to interfere in uh, the contract proceeding, which was to, elect, uh, to erect billboards on uh, O'Halloran's Hill in uh, South Australia. And, uh, she gave her reason as being one of environmental concern. That is clearly not the case. Clearly not the case. Mrs Gallus would not have even known that Mr David Battersby and the CSIRO were proposing to erect billboards on O'Halloran's Hill. The only people, Madam Deputy President, that knew were people in the advertising area. Contracts had been let for advertising on at least two of the billboards. A company had, had been employed to market those billboards. And discussions that have been had and discussions, Madam Deputy President, that I have been able to verify will confirm that Mrs Gallus acted on behalf of one of those companies and sought to have the contract terminated for, on the basis that a complaint on behalf of those companies and sought to not allow Mr Battersby and his company to enter into the advertising area. That put Mr Battersby and his wife and two children and the small company that they had confronted with a debt of over $70,000, a debt that could well have bankrupted them and forced them to sell their home. And I think that uh, we have a responsibility and the opposition who continually claim to uh, be the repositories of uh, all propriety and integrity uh, should not allow this matter to just go unnoticed uh, and try and, uh, in terms of Mrs Gallus's claim, that she contacted somehow, something came across her desk. And I would just like to uh, read uh, parts of uh, Mr Battersby's uh, statutory declaration, where he says uh, that I decided to ring uh, Chris Gallus, or Mrs Chris Gallus, uh, and see what her objections were. She stated that she was acting on environmental grounds and that I didn't have council approval. I asked Mrs Gallus whose behalf she was acting as on as no council application had been submitted and as no site works were visible, because they hadn't commenced, 
Only persons involved in the advertising industry would know about the development. She replied, something had come across her desk. During the course of our conversation, she twice asked me how much rent I was paying CSIRO. Both times I told her that was private and confidential. She then told me the project was dead and would not go ahead, stating she had previously been on some CSIRO review board and had a lot of powerful friends at CSIRO who had assured her our contract would be terminated. Now I think it's, it's very important to understand the sequence of events here because a Mr uh, Patchell of the CSIRO contacted uh, Mr Battersby um, and told him that he had had calls from Mrs Gallus and that Mrs Gallus had, uh, was applying political pressure for uh, the uh, arrangement not to proceed. Indeed, uh, Mr Patchell uh, said that during the discussion uh, the question of CSIRO sites uh, was canvassed. Sorry, um, that uh, when sorry when Mr. Patchell spoke to Mr. Battersby, he said that provided that all everything was in order, not to worry. However, <coughs> he was then contacted again and told that the contract, the agreement, had been terminated. Now, Madam Deputy President, from my uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I intend to pursue this matter. I intend to ask the Attorney General to conduct an investigation of Mrs Gallus's actions in this particular issue, because it is not acceptable that such an event has taken place and, as I understand it, has caused the CSIRO to pay a settlement to Mr Battersby. But more importantly, Mr Battersby could have earned a significant amount of income from these advertising operations. And if that's the case, if that's a position a member of the opposition wants to take, uh, with regards to small business people or people trying to create small business, then it is just not acceptable. And I will continue to pursue this matter as long as it takes to actually get the truth. Senator Noel. On the, oh, on the same Different. same matter. The same matter. Yes, thank Senator you. Senator Noel. Um, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I find it absolutely amazing that this government can actually spend all the time and resources in providing all of the information that they have to try and shaft a member of the opposition and a shadow minister, while they cannot possibly bother to spend the time and resources in excess of the 30-day limit to give me an adequate answer to a question about one of their own, one of their own being Mrs Joan Kerner. I asked the Minister for Employment, Education and Training on the 28th of September, and I've got, a, I've got some sort of an answer today. Um, where and when have meetings involving the chairperson of the uh, Employment Services Regulatory Authority, Mrs Joan Kerner, been held? And you know, the answer was that it was all a bit too hard, uh, that they couldn't justify the extensive use of resources that would be needed to, com uh, to be committed to provide the sort of detailed information being sought. In other words, we're not going to tell you about all of these things about what, where Mrs Kerner has been going and what she's been doing. Point of order, yeah, and yet you've been able to do it about Mrs Gallus. Point of order, Mr. Gallus. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I rise to the point of order that uh, what Senator Knowles is raising is not relevant to the question or the answer of the question, and I, I, I make that point, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, on the basis that I have been ruled out of order previously uh, for attempting to do the same thing. There's no point of order, Senator Murphy. That, that the matter is quite relevant to the issue that's been raised in, in terms of the way in which the government is responding to, uh, to uh, similar situations. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The, the point of the matter is that I asked for, about the meetings that Mrs Kerner was attending at taxpayers' expense, and I can't get the answers. I asked, for example, about the uh, uh, Employment Services Regulatory Authority, as in her capacity as chairman. What was her cost of the air travel? What allowances were paid? What was the cost of car transportation in each location? What were the other associated costs? How long were the meetings for? And do you know the, the answers that I get, or <laughs> pretend to get, the travel only paid to September. Here we are, tomorrow is the 1st of December, and yet they can, sh they can shaft Mrs Gallus all they like with all the resources. They give me the travel allowance until the end of September. They give me the car transport costs until the end of August. And here we are, the 1st of December, as I say, tomorrow. They cannot tell me what, uh, in answer to the question, what were the, uh, D, what were the other associated costs? They don't know. E, 
was the question, how long were the meetings for? They don't know. And if, uh, what was the purpose of the meeting? They don't know. And the same applied to her position uh, in some other capacity for uh, the federal government and any of its other agencies. And the fact of the matter is that this person, Mrs Kerner, is going around Australia at taxpayers' expense, swanning around in a com car, travelling first class. And what happened on the day of uh, the uh, 13th of September 1995? We have here that there was an ESRA board consultation held, guess where? Perth. What was Mrs Kerner doing that day? She was in the Royal Commission with Dr Lawrence. Dr Lawrence was in the Royal Commission all that day. Now, have ever we seen the footage come and go about Mrs Kerner holding her hand and collecting the flowers? Who paid the fare? Good question, Senator Boehm. The taxpayer paid a fare. The taxpayer paid a fare, the taxpayer paid her accommodation and the taxpayer paid for a com car to swan around after uh, Dr Lawrence. And here is this minister who can't answer the questions about that and yet you're prepared to put all the resources in the world to try and get Mrs Gallus. Why don't you do your parliamentary work properly instead of just running a smutty campaign? Order. It being 3.45. I put the question that uh, the Senate take note of the answer. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it.